Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this webinar. We're just going to wait a few more minutes for um, others to join, and then we're going to get going um, maybe at uh, two minutes past the hour. For everyone who's just joining now, we're just waiting one more minute and then we're going to get going once you've had a few more people joining. So a very warm welcome um, and hello to everyone who's joined us today. Um, this is the fifth in a series of webinars that Gold Standard has been leading over the past year, looking at different dimensions of the implementation of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. This webinar series is supported by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action with our thanks. In our webinar today, we're going to be looking at how new and innovative models can scale up finance and integrity under Article 6. One of the big shifts from the past period under the Kyoto Protocol to the new era of market action under the Paris Agreement is the introduction of greater flexibility. Under Article 6.2, governments and other actors have a lot more flexibility to decide on the right models for them to generate mitigation outcomes and to cooperate internationally provided they meet a set of core principles and account for their action properly. On the surface, this might mean that Article 6 is harder to describe than market approaches under the Kyoto Protocol, but what it does is it allows for new ideas and innovation in a way that could prove transformative in the future and mark a real change for how markets can support action towards the Paris Agreement's goals. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the ways in which first moving actors are filling in some of the empty space in the Article 6 rulebook and either proposing or implementing models that could be adopted by others, both under Article 6, but also more generally in market mechanisms. And we have a really great panel with us today to share their work, experiences and the main takeaways that could help others trying to take action under Article 6. So I'm really pleased to start off by introducing our panel. We have Marlin Alberg, who is Deputy Head of Division at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action in the German government. Sharif Ayoub, who is Senior Director for Finance and Operations at Sustainable Energy for All, SE for All. Jimena Aristizabal, who is Global Manager for the Designing Article 6 Policy Approaches Program at the Global Green Growth Institute, GDGI. And then Eli Sandler, who is a researcher and Israel policy fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm going to turn to the panel um, just in a second and run through a series of questions for panelists, which will last maybe 25 to 30 minutes. Um, but after that point, we're going to turn to questions which you have. So anytime from now, please feel free to write questions in the panel, either general questions you've got or specific questions to particular panelists. And we'll get to as many of those questions as we can in the second session of the panel. Um, and if you have any technical problems or other questions, please feel free to put them in the channel uh, into the chat as well. Uh, just to start off, though, I'm going to go to Jimena um, to find out more about what you're doing at GGGI. So GGGI is actively involved in some of the first examples of Article 6 implementation, working with multiple early moving countries. And one of the programs you're working on is designing policy based approaches as opposed to project based approaches under Article 6. It'd be great if you could share a bit more with us and with the audience on the rationale behind this and the progress you've been able to make so far. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. And um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, thank you, Gold Standard, for inviting GDGI to this Article 6 webinar. So as, as Hugh uh, mentioned, my name is Jimena Aristizabal, and I am the global lead of the DAPA program. This program is funded by Norway. Um, 
I, I think that DAPA is very well suited to be called a pioneer model to scale up finance with integrity within the collaborative, flexible, and innovative setting of Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. I know I have mentioned DAPA a couple of times without spelling it out, right? Uh, it stands for Designing Article 6 Policy Approaches, and its main uh, objective is to support the design of scaled-up mitigation activities that can generate mitigation outcomes. Uh, when, when I speak about policy interventions, uh, I am referring to any new regulation or any new standard or an incentive that the government can, can bring to increase mitigation ambition uh, while supporting development priorities in the host country. DAPA has been under implementation for two years in Indonesia, Morocco and Senegal. These countries are members of GTGI and have demonstrated a great leadership, uh, climate commitment and interest in exploring the use of carbon pricing instruments. Each of those countries signed a letter of intention with us uh, to start the, the program, to join the program. Uh, it's worth to mention that DAPA is about policies, right? So no one else but a government can decide on what policy instruments they want to introduce in their own territory. So GDI only supports these governments with technical studies, knowledge uh, exchange, and uh, enables internal dialogue for them to have the best access to information and tools that can facilitate their decision-making processes. All of these countries have established steering committees with representatives of different ministries, agencies, national experts, and uh, we support them in these discussions um, so they can uh, assess data and uh, other information. Without uh, going into much detail, uh, I'd like to remark, and maybe uh, very important for, for, for this webinar in gold standard, that maybe the biggest challenge for the design of this type of mitigation activities is the lack of methodologies. There are no methodologies for, for policy approaches. So uh, GGGI uh, has been using the accumulated knowledge of the CDM and the voluntary carbon markets, as well as technical guidance for the design of policy interventions uh, that was produced by the WRI or ICAT to unfold the methodological needs and fill the gaps, trying to get the highest level of environmental integrity. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are aware that uh, the introduction of a new policy in a country can have multiple uh, impacts and effects. So we are also trying to assess uh, all those potential impacts that can happen in the entire economy of the country. The initial results that we have had so far suggest that the benefits of uh, introducing selected policy interventions can generate uh, large uh, amounts of mitigation outcomes. We are speaking between um, five to 10 million tons of CO2. But maybe that's not the most important uh, uh, about policy approaches. The most important is that we can uh, address the biggest barriers to some of the problems in the countries. So specifically, uh, we are addressing the deployment of renewable energies and uh, supporting long-term transformation. Um, I have to say that the design of the solution is not finished. It is still under development. And I can provide a lot of details about the internal conversations in the countries. But um, I, I have to say that one of the most attractive uh, features for, for the governments, and maybe also the most difficult one, is that uh, they can engage different stakeholders and work together towards the solution. So the government is no, not only playing the role of uh, signing um, uh, uh, an authorization letter, uh, or authorizing only the, the transfer of international uh, mitigation outcomes, but the government becomes a central player as the aggregator and the coordinator of a series of actions uh, from the private sector, from state-owned state enterprises and others. And as a, at the same time, uh, government can distribute the benefits of carbon finance along the chain. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I just wanted to give uh, an example to illustrate the potential solutions that that we can that we can uh, develop. So, if we think about renewable energies, and we know that the cost of renewable energies is decreasing uh, in many jurisdictions around the world, we also know that it's still a challenge for many countries. It's the deployment is very slow in many of the countries. 
and there are different uh, barriers for that. Uh, in some countries, there is a lack of regulation of a regulatory framework, or they have very high taxes, or the cost of transportation inside the country is very high, or they don't have an adequate uh, powered network, or there is a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of processes, very unclear. So uh, the government is, is deciding which of those barriers can be addressed by car car carbon finance and um, that the solution is tailor-made for, for each of them. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, just to, to remark that these type of barriers would be a little bit difficult to address from a project-based solution putting everybody together to, to work at the same time and to get the benefits. It's it's very, very hard in a project-based solution. However, I don't want to say that that project uh, projects are not relevant. Projects are very important, and we in GDI also support uh, different countries in structuring carbon projects. Um, maybe, um, yeah, the last message I would like to share is that uh, this is a results-based mechanism. And at the moment, there are no transactions committed. So there are no purchase agreements signed uh, with any country. This group of countries, uh, both the donor and the potential sellers, have been working together on identifying the solution, quantifying the benefits, identifying the best methodologies uh, to monitor, report, and verify, and identifying the, the most suitable structures uh, for incentives in, in the country. And we, as GGTI, are very honored uh, with the opportunity these countries are, are granting us to work together in breaking down these problems and drafting a solution that can be the key for ambition and transformation that we need under the Paris Agreement. I think that would be it uh, from my side. Thank you very much. And I'll be here around for, for the Q&A and, and to listen to uh, the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jimena. I, I think policy-based approaches are one of those that it's just opened up under Article 6 in a way that that wasn't maybe possible before. And I think it's really interesting to see the work that GGGI is doing in an area that is complex. Um, and so it's really good. Maybe we'll have some time later to learn more about the lessons which you've learned so far and applicability elsewhere. Um, Eli, I'm going to come to you next. Um, so in your position at the Harvard Kennedy Center, you co-wrote a paper last year on alternative models for using Article 6. One was a project investment approach and the other was a private sector approach. It'd be great if you could share a little bit more about what you meant by these and why you think these types of approaches can overcome some barriers which other models might face in, in markets. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, so my name is Eli Sandler and I'm conducting research at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also working now with the World Bank on these approaches. Um, it's a very quick background. I'm going to go through the slides quite quickly, but what I really want to do is get into kind of a, a question about how these models can actually function. So we published this report, as you said, ahead of COP27 uh, in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, um, and with a number of professors from the Kennedy School, including um, Larry Summers, Joe Aldi, James Sullivan, and a number of others. And the, the thing we're trying to ultimately address is this problem. So I think we think about Article 6 very generally, um, often it can get siloed into carbon markets. But our approach was to say, uh, at Sharm el-Sheikh, the need for cross-border investment in clean infrastructure was determined to be $6 trillion. And uh, this is what we have currently. So we have a huge way to go by 2030 to get to enough international investment in carbon mitigation. Um, if you talk to people in the, I mean, in the webinar here, what most people say is that blended finance is the main way to do this. So you have public sector money going to subsidize some part of a, of a transaction or a project, and this brings down the cost of capital and allows the private sector to supply a lot of that $6 trillion. But if you look at the amount of blended finance happening currently in the climate sector, it's unbelievably small. I actually had to check this number several times because I was so shocked. It's $1 billion of investment is happening through blended finance in the climate mitigation sector, and we need to get to $6 trillion. And so the, the approach that I'm going to present here are trying to, to get at that fact. Um, so stepping back again, what we found when we did about a year worth of research talking to people and policymakers and market participants about Article 6 is that generally speaking, it's understood to be what we call the direct purchase approach. This basically means that a financing state, call it the UK, call it the UAE, America, whatever it is, will hand over cash in exchange for receiving ITMOs. Um, now, this might be through a project. This this might be government to government transfer, but essentially you can think of this model as almost like an emissions trading scheme, but between governments. Um, 
The problem is that if this is how Article 6 is construed, we don't think anyone is going to use it on a large scale and certainly not on the scale we need to reach that six trillion dollar number. Um, the problem is, is both on the supply and the demand side. So financing states, um, that's developed states, uh, are not willing to hand over cash for ITMOs. So we talk to the UK, France, Germany, etc. And using taxpayer money to acquire Article 6 credits is just not a politically feasible thing to do. At the same time, host states, uh, we're talking to Morocco, Rwanda, Jordan, these kind of places, um, in order to generate emissions reductions that can then be sold as ITMOs, you need upfront capital. And this is one of the problems that um, we're working on a lot with the World Bank is carbon markets are not great right now at providing upfront capital to projects. It's beginning to happen in terms of the securitization of carbon credits or uh, upfront loan agreements, but a very small proportion of projects, have, and we'll get to policy approaches in a sec, um, have upfront capital. And that means that you can't actually generate the MOs you would then sell. So the main insight is that this approach um, would not work. Now, this is not a new new uh, insight. And actually, a lot of the academic literature about the CDM, about Article 6, has pointed out that the approach on screen is not going to work, but it's still the predominant understanding in the market. So what we proposed is what we've called the project investment approach. Um, now, the, the new part of that is actually investment rather than project. And it's the idea that financing states will invest in carbon mitigation projects and host states at a concessional level. And in exchange for that investment, they will receive a proportion of the project emissions reductions. So as an example, uh, the UK, instead of buying some emissions reductions credit from um, Rwanda, would give a concessional loan or uh, an equity investment with a low hurdle rate or a sovereign guarantee or a grant or mezzanine financing or any sort of um, security to finance upfront a project. And in exchange, it would receive a proportion of the emissions reductions. Um, now, there's a lot of benefits to this model. One is it's much, much easier for host states for, to um, actually use the money if it comes in through standard financial instruments. So we're trying to break down the silo between carbon markets, which is um, often quite apart from other types of climate finance. And then what finance ministers, development ministers, energy ministers in developing countries are used to dealing with, which is debt, equity and, and, uh, and grants. Um, the second thing is that if you talk to financing states, it's much, much easier to access pools of capital in the form of securities. So you can go through sovereign wealth funds. This is who we're talking to in the Gulf. You can go through uh, state investment and development banks. This is often the European approach. Um, and so you, you unlock much more capital um, and then you, you fund upfront projects. The other big advantage of this is that because you're providing upfront financing, you can really de-risk uh, private sector investment. So the point of this Article 6 investment is blended finance. You provide concessional finance to bring down the blended cost of capital for uh, emerging market projects. Finally, the other method we talk about, and this is very close to what Jimena spoke about, is what we call the private sector approach. Now, broadly, there are a lot of different policy approaches that can be used to um, implement Article 6. And so these are still being developed. And I think the term policy approach can be quite nebulous. And so what we did is we talked about it in terms of a private sector approach, which means the government outsources the acquisition of ITMOs to the private sector. What this means is you have a carbon border tax that is paid in ITMOs, or you link your emissions trading scheme with another country. And it's basically saying we want to acquire um, credits we can use for our NDC. We want the private sector to do it for us. And so this is the um, approach, for example, kind of most, most advancedly used by the Click Foundation in Switzerland, where uh, motor oil companies uh, have to, you know, the, the mechanisms are quite complicated, but they have to pay a, what is essentially a carbon border tax in credits that they will acquire from somewhere else. And our idea is that they don't only need to do this by handing over cash and receiving credits, they can also do it by investment and getting that double board online. Um, very briefly, uh, and, and we can go into the model more, and I'm very happy to, to speak afterwards and put my contact details in the chat. What we've designed is a financial model that says, to the extent you bring down the weighted average cost of capital, that's the extent to which you get um, a proportion of the project emissions reductions. So I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is a case study we've been working on with the UAE in Morocco, where Mubadala would invest concessional debt in a solar field in Morocco. And in exchange for bringing down the cost of capital, um, uh, you see there on the on the left hand side, the, the cost of debt we imagined the UAE invest and the total cost of capital, make the project um, financeable by the private sector, and then the UAE would receive a proportion of those emission reductions. Um, so the key takeaways from what I've been presenting are that one, Article 6 should be used for project investment. 
Uh, we think this is more likely to be used. It generates greater impact because it provides upfront capital. And also we can reach a much, much larger scale. So instead of just thinking of this as a policy measure or as essentially an emissions trading scheme between governments, this becomes on the level of trillions of dollars because it's investment rather than purchasing credits. Uh, is not a binary and it's measured on a scale by the impact on cost of capital. So what do I mean by this? At the moment, um, under and this comes from the origins of what we talk about in additionality, which is the CDM and joint implementation under the Kyoto Protocols. Um, once a project was determined to be additional, um, someone like Gold Standard or Vera would, would make the additionality um, test, then broadly speaking, all of the carbon credits are kind of up for grabs. And what this does, if you think about it, is it incentivizes you to invest in the least additional project that is still additional. Um, and so this creates a real conflict of interest. And so what we're saying is actually the more you lower the, the cost of capital to where the market will finance it, um, the more uh, project emissions reductions you should receive. Next, um, the private sector is crucial to Article 6. This could be through blended finance, i.e. once you've lowered that cost of capital through the project investment approach, um, the private sector comes in and finances the rest at market rates or directly through the private sector approach, which is um, similar to the policy instruments that Humana talked about, outsourcing the acquisition of it most to the private sector. Um, next, we think that this can consolidate a lot of different carbon markets um, financing vehicles into the broader climate finance discussion. So coming out of COP and generally in the market, there's a huge array of different tools governments and developers can use to finance infrastructure. You have the voluntary carbon markets, you've got the JetP, you've got the Energy Transition Accelerator. And what we're trying to do in working with each of these organizations um, is say that all of this can be understood as impacts on costs of capital, and this can all be consolidated into Article 6. And then finally, from our side, um, as I said, I'm now working with the World Bank. We're working on kind of fleshing out this methodology. How do you determine WAC? How do you determine impact? Where should the pilots be? And there's a lot of um, more theoretical and, and practical work needs to be done. Uh, and then we're also working with the UAE as part of their COP28 agenda to design actual pilots and say, um, we should have projects that are financed by Article 6 as soon as possible. Um, so as I said, this is um, work was first presented uh, in and around COP27 from the paper that we delivered. Um, and we're now uh, trying to make actionable. So I'm very happy to talk about how this can interact with the other panelists or, uh, or to hear from the audience. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very Great. much, Eli. Thanks. And I I hope we have some questions around that because I think um, there are some ideas in the work which was just presented, which are represent quite a change from how things have been done traditionally in markets. So I'm really interested to hear questions from the audience and to unpack some of that a little bit more um, once we get to the question session later. Um, we're going to switch course a little bit um, and Marlon, we're going to come to you on a topic which is which is a bit different, but shows the breadth of different things which are going on under Article 6, really, and in the context of markets and carbon credits under the um, under the Paris Agreement. Um, and Marlon, the German government has for many years been an advocate for robust claims in the voluntary carbon market, and you've supported work by Gold Standard, but also by others to look at this topic in the context of the Paris Agreement. Last year, the German government itself issued a tender for um, carbon credits to offset travel related emissions from public officials with a condition that these credits must be correspondingly adjusted by the project's host country, which I think was one of the first examples of this happening for the voluntary market in this way, especially from a government. Um, it'd be great if you could share a little bit more about the process of tendering, how others in the government or the private sector could learn from this and where you are in this phase. Um, yes, uh, thank you, you. I, I mean, uh, I will speak uh, completely on another level than uh, Ellie uh, did. Uh, but I, um, before I uh, give this an example that we uh, already purchased uh, a kind of uh, Article 6 um, uh, forwards, um, I wanted also to react on his presentation as uh, uh, I uh, just wanted to to try to give, build a bridge uh, to, uh, to 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 my my uh, intervention here, um, I I think um, yes the experience that uh, there is a lack of upfront uh, capital for project uh, implementation is um, always an uh, important uh, part in in 
in, in regard to market mechanism in general. And um, the German government had for that also developed a, uh, um, a, a foundation to, to support uh, specific project developments, as well as that we now also support um, uh, the development of uh, Article 6 pilots. So uh, I think that is, is a small, um, how to say, we can't solve the general problem with uh, such kind of pro programs, but uh, that's the way how we try to um, soften uh, the problem of uh, uh, lack of uh, upfront capital for good project implementation, especially in, in countries where uh, investments are, um, are um, more, um, or face higher risk uh, than in other countries. So um, yes, in regard to our uh, um, purchase, I can't say purchase program, we don't have a purchase program, but however we uh, purchase uh, uh, credits, UN credits since 2014 uh, for uh, our official travel emissions from um, to, to offset uh, 120 governmental institutions uh, in Germany. So um, for us, uh, the last years, it was always clear that we wanted to purchase UN credits. And there we also uh, um, had uh, uh, choose uh, high quality CDM projects. Um, we did not purchase any uh, German uh, mitigation project uh, from the voluntary car market, for instance, as we already saw the problem of double counting um, within the Kyoto Protocol. So for us, it was quite clear that these uh, credits has to come from uh, outside uh, uh, Europe. Um, the least, as we, we didn't have uh, JI available in, 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 in uh, Germany anymore since 2012. So um, um, during that period, we had elaborated a, a, a set of criteria for, for these uh, projects. And, um, um, and of course, uh, we wanted then, uh, when uh, the uh, Paris uh, Agreement came into force, it was for us clear that we won't be able to offset uh, um, the emission from 2021 with CDM uh, uh, credits anymore. And therefore, we uh, um, did a new procurement uh, and asked for um, Article 64 credits. It was clear that, uh, or the challenge is that there is no credits available for, 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 for the time being. Um, but uh, we wanted uh, definitely to, to uh, yeah, set a good good example that that it is possible already today to say yes, we stick to that that we want to be um, um, to to offset our emission, and this is only for us only possible with uh, credits that are not double used and uh, uh, and uh, uh, thus cor the the topic uh, corresponding adjustment is for us important in this regard so we uh, ask for uh, credits that uh, are um, or that um, um, project developer that they, they could uh, submit bids uh, where uh, they say okay, we have already proven with a verification report that this emission reduction had um, taken place after uh, uh, um, the, um, the uh, December 2020. So uh, only these emission reduction in 2021 were eligible to, to uh, um, apply. Furthermore, um, it was important that they uh, also submitted a verification report, and that was, I think that is was also quite challenging for 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 project developers, as uh, it was. In, uh, we did the uh, the procurement um, um, last um, 
autumn. So, um, and uh, furthermore, it was also uh, of advantage if they could uh, um, submit a kind of letter of intent that the host country is also interested to submit this uh, project as an Article 6.4 uh, project as far uh, it is uh, possible to do so um, and um, that they um, are willing to do uh, the um, uh, corresponding uh, adjustment accordingly then later on when, when it's possible to do so. So we received um, um, two projects. Uh, 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 from one project developer, uh, uh, unfortunately, I would say. I mean, at least we, we received some, and we we thought we we do this tender like try and error. We wanted to see what is there in the market, and uh, 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 for us, it's um, clear that we will continue this way. That we will. Uh, do uh, these tender also uh, in this year and, and in, in the next coming years, um, um, as we think that this is um, a good way to s uh, demonstrate that it is possible, or to, to stay in your uh, uh, words, uh, that we send the signal uh, to the market that it is uh, that we walk the walk uh, and. Um, um, yeah, and we are, uh, I think, uh, um, as far as um, we are more, uh, as it more well known that we will do these tenders every year, uh, I think it's, uh, we will also receive um, more uh, application. Uh, and uh, so I think in a way for us, it's like, um, we made the experience like uh, similar to the very beginning of uh, of the CDM, and um, there you you didn't also exactly know where the journey will go, and um, uh, and uh, the the market player were uh, were not or the number of market player were not really active yet. So, but that's changed, and we hope that this will also change uh, um, in. Uh, um, course of the time. So, um, yeah, and of course we could also as a government uh, think about to uh, uh, develop our or in, to, to do a kind of project investment uh, that we invest in one project with one country uh, for, for um, um, this kind of uh, um, voluntary commitment. Um, but um, this is right um, for the time being uh, not discussed within the government. And uh, I think it's also, um, I would say that for purchasing credits for uh, the, the voluntary compensation of uh, official flights, um, which we don't we, we don't count this towards our NDC. We uh, cancel these credits. Uh, I don't think that um, we would need to set up such a kind of uh, a project investment. It's rather if you uh, if a government really decide to um, have a, um, a, a larger program and uh, then to set up a, a fund where you could uh, um, do such kind of uh, project investment, then it, it makes, uh, for me, in my view, really sense. So it, it's, a, it's a question of scale, uh, in my view. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I mean, I think there's some really important points that came across there in terms of that demand signal being there and this being something which is is regular and also just having a model that's partly what we're talking about here, models which can be learned from and drawn uh, upon by others. And sometimes those are for large scale investments. Sometimes that's just as an organization wanting to offset my emissions in the Paris context, what's the model for going about it? So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Sharif, coming to you now. Um, one of the most exciting things that happened, I think, on markets at COP27 was the launch of the African Carbon Markets Initiative. Um, and SE for All, Sustainable Energy for All, was one of the organizations really driving that and still is. 
Um, the initiative last month, I think, announced 13 action programs, and you've already drawn $200 million, I think, of advanced commitments to purchase credits. It'd be great if you could share a little bit more about the work which SE for All is doing in the market space, what you're doing under the African Carbon Markets Initiative. And I know a lot of it's about the voluntary carbon market, so a little bit more about how you see Article 6 featuring in its work. Thank you very much, Hugh, and, and um, um, I would like I would like to thank uh, Gold Standard for inviting SU for all for this um, important webinar. Um, let me start with the opportunity itself, uh, and the focus here is is Africa, uh, but the work that we have been doing is actually kind of precursor to the global south, um, and we expected that it's going to be replicated in in Southeast Asia, South Asia, as well as Latin America as well. In terms of the opportunity, I'll just share some figures with you that we that we have announced at COP27. Um, and that was really the result at the, 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 to create uh, to create ACME. So the ambition of ACME in the focus on Africa is to reach uh, 300 MT of annual retirements by 2030. This is actually about 20 times the level of 2020 retirement. So it's actually quite ambitious, we know, but we also feel it's achievable. Now, obviously, uh, this target assumes that the global market for carbon credits um, um, grows and the growing and, and along with the growing uh, share of, of African credits in the market. And then from 200 from 300 MTs in 2030, we we looking beyond 2030, we hope that we make our way to 1.5 GTs by 2050. Um, besides worker and quality and integrity, we'll, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, the hope here is that we increase the, the price of African credits um, to at least $20 a ton uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, I, I just came back from Addis Ababa yesterday. We had a session at the Africa Business Forum on, on carbon credits. Um, and we were all struck uh, in the audience um, and participants that uh, credits, I think, out of Japan um, are somewhere around 120, if I believe. And the African credits are barely touching 11, 12, and they're quite actually volatile. Um, for us to achieve, we hope that we, we kind of stabilize around $20 a ton, and we'll talk about ways and means that we're hoping to do that to, to get a market size of about $6 billion by 2030 and then increase to about $120 billion by 2050, um, assuming that it makes its way to $80 a ton. Like I said, Japan recently is $120, uh, so we feel it's actually quite conservative, um, but uh, it serves as a base case scenario. In terms of co-benefits, and there are many co-benefits um, to, to the work that we, that we hope to do. Um, 30 million jobs across the continent by 2030. Now that assumes new jobs, but then also uh, better paying existing jobs such as smallholder farmers participating in the carbon markets, for example. Um, in 2050, we hope that we we um, are having more than uh, 100 million jobs supported by the work that we do. Now there's, let me just pause on the co-benefits. So there's many ways and means that project developers can, can work on this. And, uh, my co-panelers uh, have mentioned that. So Eli um, and Jimena mentioned in terms of the importance of the role of the private sector, which is at the core of our work as well. But there is, when we say the private sector here, there's actually quite diverse mix. So I mentioned smallholder farmers. There is uh, potential project developers that work on uh, e-cooking, for example. And here the co-benefits, particularly in the global south, unfortunately, because women are the most affected by using charcoal, for example, to cook uh, and associated health benefits. There's co benefits to that. Um, one is actually, as our CEO says, um, literally saving her life. Uh, two other co benefits in terms of um, uh, using uh, solar power for productive for productive use, and we're actually announcing many um, achievements on that in Nigeria uh, this week as well. So, uh, and then if we say that we're using solar power also to power health clinics uh, and generating credits for that as well, kind of maintains itself in terms of clinics uh, and improving healthcare uh, to, to the global south. Um, so what are we trying to do within ACME? As you mentioned, the 13 point program, and we were struck by the level of intensity of feedback, positive feedback uh, in our announcement of COP27. Um, so we had the presidents of Ghana speak, we had the president of Kenya speak. Um, there is obviously um, a lot of support from uh, the president of Malawi, as well as the presidency in Nigeria. So from a political support level, we've seen it go from a ministerial level engagement to a presidential level engagement. So this is um, something that we're we're in the midst of, of dealing with because obviously when you have presidents engaged, um, it's it's uh, it's a double edged sword. There's a lot of interest. You can get a lot of feedback from the from the from different ministries, the apparatus of the state, but at the same time also uh, it puts a lot of pressure on us to be able to deliver across the different spectrums. Uh, so that's but I'll take it in a positive sense. 
So what we're trying to do is within ACME is to deal kind of with three pillars of developing of carbon markets in Africa. Again, a case study that will, will most likely be replicated in the global south. One is in the supply side. And here we're working with countries on what we call carbon market activation plans. And that's actually quite diverse. So here we're looking at the evolution of the country, um, how the carbon credits within the country are, are, are the opportunities that, that, that exist, what are the particular laws and regulations that um, either prohibit or make it difficult to, to generate credits from that particular market, uh, or others that will need to be created to facilitate that as well. There are some discussions that are taking place. We're actually very happy for these to take place between the different ministries. I'll give you an example, the Ministry of Finance. How are we taxing carbon credits? Is that going to go straight into this? Are we going to create a carbon credit tax? Uh, in our involvement with Kenya now, we're hearing that the Kenyans um, are assuming a more simplified approach, which is actually quite good, that they're saying that they're going to be taxing the credits as normal corporate tax. So if a, if a developer generates a product that uh, generates credits and generates corporate revenue, then the, the Kenyan authorities will just tax it as, as corporate credits, which is a simplified approach. There are some questions in terms of land rights. So for example, in the Congo Basin, um, what happens with the reforestation of, of, um, of forests? Um, are these uh, owned by the state? Or are these owned by the project developers? Or is there a split of some sort in between? Going back to the fiscal policy, I forgot to mention, there's actually a very good discussion between the different ministries. Um, our, our revenues of the state generated from carbon credits, even if it goes a corporate tax, are we going to go 100% into the fiscal budget of the state? Um, or is there going to be some kind of a split between the fiscal budget and the state and some kind of a, a mitigation and adaptation fund of some sort that focuses on climate change uh, in these countries? So these are, th and then we're working in terms of how do we, um, apart from the carbon market activation plans, we're looking at how do we increase the technical capacity of project developers. Again, it touches on uh, Jimenez and Eli's uh, comments on terms of the importance of the private sector. I think Eli's point is more on the structuring. I think what our focus is, beside the structuring, which is actually quite important, the capacity on the ground in developing countries of the project developers to undertake the projects across the board. Um, we're looking at de-risking instruments, and I think the work that Eli is doing is actually quite interesting that we would like to learn a bit more about. Um, and the, high, the idea here is to engage the financiers of some sort. So that's the African Open Bank, that's the African uh, Import Exit Bank, there is the Echo Bank, there is the Standard Chartered, as well as others. So I think uh, in that respect, we're looking at how do we engage them to be able to kind of get financing into project developers that can actually generate credits on the ground. There is work that we can do in terms of de-risking instruments. Um, it could be some kind of a partial guarantee or a full guarantee of some sort. Uh, it could be uh, some kind of political insurance that we can engage with MEGA as well as others on, which is something that we're exploring. And the whole idea here, uh, Hugh, is that, is that we want to make sure that we are creating the enabling environment that generates as much credit as possible in, from, in the context of Africa. One thing that we're also working with uh, Gold Standard there, so thank you very much for that, Hugh, uh, and Integrity Council is uh, re-examining perhaps the taxonomies and methodologies and the standards that exist in in the space of um, of carbon credits, um, and and see if there is any particular contextualization that can be done to cater for perhaps a bit more um, things that uh, that matter to global south. And one and one example that I'll give is uh, diesel displacement. These are the generator displacements. There are perhaps some standards, but the idea here is that can we re-examine some of these standards that to see how applicable they are to, uh, to project developers on the ground. Um, and doing so, and, and the challenge here is that we have to do so in a manner that no way, shape or form compromises the integrity of, of the credits that come out uh, come out of Africa. So these are all supply side issues that we're trying to deal with. On the demand side, we're trying to reach out to, um, again, to as a re-risking advanced market commitments to refer to 200 million. Um, I'm happy to announce that we are well, well on our way to 450, and we hope to announce by COP28 $1 billion of advanced market commitments of for, for African credits. So that, that will be a huge achievement if we're able to get that from now until until uh, COP28. Associated with that, we're having discussion in the last couple of days, is, is not just advanced market commitments, it's commitments, but we want to show retirements as well. So we want to be able to link the, um, the commitments with the retirements and maybe give preferential treatment to buyers who are committed to retire or want to or wanna retire uh, at, the, at the short end of the curve. We're also taking a look at in terms of advocating the co-benefits of African credits uh, as some of the things I mentioned there before. And the idea here is that we want to make sure that we are able to kind of 
uh, increase the price of credit to be able to plow it back into Africa for, for development projects. Um, and then, so that's the second pillar, which is the demand side. And then in between is the intermediation. Um, uh, I'm a trained economist, and we were trained earlier on that supply and demand forces meet miraculously, but in the development context, uh, I'm afraid it doesn't quite work that way. So the idea here is that what can we do as an institution? Creating a, a, an end room or institute, institution of some sort that is based in Africa, we're most likely going to establish in Kenya, that is able to facilitate the meeting of the supply and demand to be able to get a lot of these resources back to the project developers. One initiative that we're working on, for example, is the verification and validation, um, is to make sure that we reduce as much as possible transaction costs to be able to, again, reduce the transaction costs going back to project developers into Africa. Just give you some figures that we are aware of that uh, we hear that sometimes um, as much as 70 to 80 percent of the cost of the credits goes to actually transaction cost and the project developers end up with 20, 30, as little as 20 or 30 uh, percent of, of the price of the credit uh, eventually. So the challenge upon us is that what, what, can, what can we do to be able to push that? And I think, again, you will have this conversation. We've had it with Vera as well. And we're looking for ways it means can we digitize in one way or form the auditing and verification to be able to kind of, I don't know, use your spatial data, take a look at some automations that can be done to, again, increase the integrity, but do it in a way that's probably a bit more efficient to get more money back into Africa. I'll, 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 I'll end with this. And this is not a, an overestimation from our part. We feel that carbon credits could has the potential to completely transform development finance. I think in the past, African countries in particular, I can focus here as in Africa, um, has been um, highly reliant on bilateral financing and, and development financing. And we try to push the ways and means to get the private sector involved. But and the IFC has been doing a great job in that, but I think there is still a, mis a discomfort sometimes from, from um, um, the private sector globally to invest in Africa for perceived risks and fiscal imbalances, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea here is that we could, this could be, it may very well be one of Africa's greatest exports. Um, and the idea here is that Africans can generate credits, sell it in the global markets, and then plow it back into developments. Um, so that's as it relates to voluntary markets. What we're also planning on engaging, and it came from Edis, like I mentioned, we're discussing with UNECA as well as other partners uh, in the G20 and the COP28 presidency, the idea of um, loosening perhaps or getting access to the, the compliance markets in Europe, in Japan, in Korea, and California for African credits. And if we're able to do that, we hope to be able to, again, increase the price of African credits. So this is something that we will we will be planning to engage with the G20 presidency on. We've already engaged with the, G, with the COP28 and most likely raise it up at, um, at the European Union level, as well as other regulators. Um, so it's actually kind of interesting time that we go from a VCM to or international VCM to access to the compliance markets of sorts. So let me just stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Sharif. Um, that was hugely helpful and and a lot in there to respond to as well. And and so if anyone does have any more questions, please feel free to write them into the, the chat. Um, I, I wanted to open it up now to the the panel to react to anything which you've heard from others. Eva, I think you want to go first and then we'll, we'll just start up a conversation. I'll try to bring in some of the, com the questions that we've had in the chat box. Um, thank you very much. This is super and I will try to be quite brief because I imagine there's a lot of uh, responses to be had. Um, the first thing I think is an interesting point that Malin made about the way in which the German government is thinking about offsetting. Um, this is first in the in the context of, of flights. Um, and the way you presented it, I think, is, is kind of the core driver of why we want to move towards what we call the project investment approach, which is that um, the pot of money that is allocatable from the German government budget to buying carbon credits is just very, very small. It's never going to reach hundreds of millions or billions or, or tens of billions of dollars. And so you mentioned that there's the possibility maybe to set up a fund in the future that would um, that would purchase credits. And my response would be that you actually already have two. One is GIZ and one is KFW. Um, these are like really premier development finance institutions that are investing quite large amounts of money in very interesting projects and very impactful projects around the world. And so what we're trying to do is basically say, if that model, the KFW and GIZ, who already have the expertise, can be leveraged to specifically invest in carbon mitigation projects, and you can measure the impact in terms of private capital crowded in and carbon emissions reduced, this opens up an entire new, I guess you could think of it as a pot of money that can be used for um, 
uh, carbon mitigation in the developing world. But the, the crucial thing is that these are not institutions that buy things. It's not um, purchasing things from a government budget. It's, it's about investing um, and creating a double bottom line return of uh, a kind of a concessional level financial return and then a carbon credit return the German government could use to meet its NDC. Um, be very interested in your thoughts. And then the second thing I wanted to say very briefly is to um, Sharif, I thought what your, in general, what the African Carbon Markets Initiative is doing is excellent, and I found your presentation very helpful. Um, I think that the the idea of, of getting to, to millions or even billions of dollars of, of carbon credits retired is, is great. The problem is that um, even with that great goal, this is nowhere near in the order of magnitude of capital that is needed to actually transform the, the African economy. Um, and especially if you think about it in carbon terms, like this is not even going to make a small dent in the developed world's emissions. So it's, it's not going to be a large proportion of the NDC of any developed country if we're talking in the millions of dollars. It'll be like 0.1% of a, of a country's carbon. And so I think in order to get to really substantial cross-border flows using Article 6, we have to start talking about energy systems which is basically um, decarbonizing from coal and gas in the grid. And um, this is when I think the point you made about capacity is very, very interesting because the work you're doing on capacity, capacity building, I think is excellent. But I, I personally don't view that as the point of Article 6. I think the point of Article 6 is to lower the cost of capital. Um, and this relates to a question that was in the chat about what difficulties will securitization of the carbon credits market face given the variability in price, I think from, from Brandon. Um, it, it's going to get very, very wonkish, so I apologize. But in the in the latest guidance from Article 6.2, um, ultimately, you, it, it's a bilateral transaction, so basically anything can be done. But there's the advice of something called non-bankability, which means theoretically, if you, if you generate a credit, um, you can't hold it and then use it 10 years later. Uh, you have to use it in the same uh, NDC period in which it's generated. Um, now, these things are guidance and they're not finalized, so everything's a bit up in the air, as we know from the COP negotiations. But this is one of the reasons why I think that conceptualizing an Article 6 transaction as the purchase and sale of carbon credits um, just ultimately won't be able to get us to hundreds of billions of dollars. And instead, we have to think about it as concessional investment and um, financing projects that then become commercially viable because you brought down the cost of capital. So um, one of the things Sharif said is that carbon credits should be the main export of Africa. Um, and I would I would always turn that on its head and say the main export of Africa should be products. It should be green hydrogen, it should be manufactured goods, and carbon credits are a way of making that viable. Like I, I don't think the, the export of Africa should be carbon credits that are then bought. What we should think is the cost of capital right now in Africa is really, really high. We can use carbon credits to bring that cost of capital down um, if it's investment rather than purchasing and selling credits. And that means that then Africa can export goods and develop and industrialize in the same way as um, the global north has. Um, so that was the, the intervention I wanted to make and I would be uh, extremely happy to hear your responses. Yeah, I'll open it up if anyone wants to respond. I mean, I think anyone could actually on this point. And, and just, um, while responding, if anyone, what there was a question in the chat which came through, which is an interesting one as well about um, the lack of registry, so national registries um, to manage Article Six um, ITMOs and developments there. So, if anyone wants to react to that point as well, please feel free to do so. Um, Sharif, I think you un unmuted. Yeah, so, if, Sharif, and then to Yeah, if I may, just because I have to drop off actually at um, at uh, at five my time. Um, so, I think uh, no, these are very good points, uh, Eli. So, I think it's. Uh, it, the idea here is that um, it's evolving and we're we're learning as we go. Um, I think in the context of Africa, um, the whole point here is that uh, it's not it's not one or the other, but it's it, it's more all, all the above. So definitely, I think there are discussions on the green hydrogen. There's you know there's uh, other aspects as well. Um, again, when I was in Addis, they were talking about the free trade agreement and, and and whatnot in terms of how can that help with the with the base. And we're helping in terms of looking at the supply chains, the renewable supply chains. The point here is that. Does, it, does this provide an opportunity to generate much needed financing to both the private sector um, and the governments from a very low base? The answer is yes. Um, then if that's the case, can it transform whereby African countries are having a bit more of a control of their destiny, relatively more control of their destiny vis-a-vis -vis now when they have to travel to Washington or Paris and whatnot? The answer is yes. Um, so the challenge is upon us and upon them to, to make it happen uh, in terms of uh, what is what are the things that we can do with the project developers and and, and whatnot? Um, 
Article six is it finance or the project developers? Again, it's it's, it's all of the above. So I think even if it's focused on one particular thing, I think there's things that we can do across the board to to make sure that we unblock as much as possible some of some of the challenges for for this to take hold. Um, so yeah, so that's my my initial reaction. I think you have had other comments on, on uh, Marilyn as well. Great, thank you, um, Marlon, Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, I mean, Germany is uh, no compliance buyer, uh, as uh, we have within the EU one uh, domestic target, which we uh, we uh, won't intend to 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 that when we won't uh, uh, um, uh, use any international credit. So. If we purchase uh, credits, it's always uh, voluntary, and we use usually uh, climate finance money for that. But at the same time, uh, the complicated thing is that um, when we use climate finance uh, money for carbon market, we have to be sure that the credits that are generated there is not uh, uh, find its way to for for the uh, um, in, in, into the co um, compliance market as we uh, uh, report uh, these money also as um, ODA. So um, this is but but that I I would say um, that is specific uh, the German case. Um, other um, uh, climate finance uh, providers, <laughs> how to say, they have a, a, other uh, um, regulation in this regard. But we also think um, if we, if a certain portion of uh, climate finance would not um, be needed to, to be reported as ODA, then we could also, for instance, um, uh, blend um, or use climate finance money uh, to purchase uh, uh, or invest in projects uh, where uh, uh, credits are generated and then uh, the 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 um, um, the revenue could be reinvested in 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 the project again that would also be uh, an option really to to uh, um, yeah generate more money for uh, uh, climate uh, action. Then furthermore, where we also um, think is, um, or where we think that we need more thoughts and thinking and ideas is how to, um, to combine uh, existing uh, um, finance instruments like uh, export credits, for instance, or other uh, 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 um, uh, finance instrument with carbon finance in order to bring the cost down but at the same time of course to choose the uh, um, activities um, that are additional so uh, that is quite tricky but uh, we think that um, they are still uh, more thoughts and ideas to be generated in in the regard to how to combine different uh, um, finance uh, instruments with each other. Great. So Thank yeah, you. that's for, for the time being. That Thanks. Is. Great. Um, we, we're coming up to the hour and I'm keen not to go too far beyond that because I don't want to, to take up people's time beyond that. But um, Kimena, I wanted to come to you to to see what you want to say on this point. Um, but then also, if you can, there's a, an interesting question which has come through on how small island developing states um, can access the policy levers that we're talking about. And Eli, you might want to talk about that again as well, because you're looking at kind of larger scale investments. It'd be good to know from, from you. So we'll maybe just take a few kind of short answers. And there was a question earlier about which credits are the highest quality and the answer is simple we don't need to <laughs> address that here but no on um, um transparent carbon market prices there are good places where you can you can find carbon market price data so allied offsets trove research um ecosystem marketplace and others provide this this data which could be helpful um him and i'll come to you and then over to eli and short answers if possible and then we'll we'll try to wrap up after that Sure, no problem. I, I just wanted to make a, a comment and that I think all the, all the solutions that uh, Eli and Sheriff uh, presented are great and also the uh, activities that Germany is, is uh, 
is doing is, is, are great to accelerate the market. Just a comment for a lie that uh, investment is not the only need. Uh, as, as as I mentioned, like maybe there are some big regulatory barriers, even if there are a lot of investors or a lot of people interested in, in accelerating the markets, they are not able to do that in certain locations. So it's it's very important to look at the context and not all solutions are, are appropriate for all countries. And uh, I just uh, I was wondering, uh, I wanted to ask a sheriff about these this buyers. Uh, it's interesting that they uh, managed to secure uh, a lot of funding upfront for, for for purchasing some some credits. But I am interested in knowing, is it from buy, uh, so for, from countries uh, trying to, to comply with their NDCs or is it from the private sector? Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, Sharif's had to drop off. I think I think it's mostly private sector from my understanding, but don't hold me to that on that. Um, Eli, over to you. Sure, thank you very much. So I think, yeah, Jimena, you're completely right. Um, and so we, for example, have been looking at uh, implementing this approach in sub-Saharan Africa. And two of the places we were originally looking were Namibia and South Africa. And in South Africa, there is really there's actually no shortage of capital trying to be invested into a whole slew of projects mostly focused on renewable energy. But the biggest barriers to decarbonizing the economy are really not um, a high cost of capital. So they need a lot of money, but the, the barriers are regulatory, mostly to do with ESCOM. Um, and that is, for example, is not the case in Namibia, where what we need is we see there are project investors that are interested in putting money into Namibia, but the returns that they can generate are not commensurate with the risk. So what I would say is addressing regulatory barriers is extremely important. But I, I think of Article 6, and maybe this is, you know, we all come from our own biases, and, and mine is, I, my background is in financing. I think of Article 6 mostly as a tool to reduce the cost of capital and bridge the gap between projects that would reduce carbon and increase development in um, developing countries, but that the private sector won't finance. Um, so that goes also to two of the questions in the in the chat. One is from Jan Willem, um, who I, I, I hope that I can illustrate my point quite well with this. He says that... Um, not sure that carbon credits buy down the cost of capital, it's a revenue stream. And so our idea is that actually carbon credits should not be a revenue stream. Carbon credits should be generated by the financing of CapEx at uh, concessional levels. And so that then, and, and it's a change, it's a new approach to Article 6, and this is what we're developing with the World Bank. Um, and this also goes then to the question about uh, small island developing states, such as those in the Caribbean. Um, in, in my mind, the way to leverage Article 6 is to find projects that the private sector would finance um, if the, you can think of it as two sides of the same coin, if the return was higher or the cost of capital was lower. And those projects just do not give a return that is commensurate with the risk that the private sector sees. Just like really fake dummy numbers. Let's say you have a, a project in Fiji um, to uh, replace, I don't know, um, diesel generators with solar panels. And uh, it turns out the market would be willing to finance that at, at kind of a 12% cost of capital. Um, and and the, the beneficiaries of that can only afford uh, 10%. So I think the, the, the role of Article 6 finance is to bridge that gap when there is not a commensurate risk and return. Um, so when we think about small island developing states, I'm like so far away from being an expert in this. But I think the thing to find is projects that have both development and carbon benefits, but that need blended finance subsidization in order to actually occur. Great. Thank you, Eli. Um, we've, we've gone past the hour and I think we're um, people are starting to move on to whatever comes next to them, depending on their time of day. Um, so I just wanted to finish there, but to finish by saying thank you very much to the panel. So to um, Kimena, to um, Marlin, to Eli and to Sharif for sharing the work which you're doing, which I mean goes in many different directions, but I think shows the the different ways in which article 6 can be harnessed in order to drive greater investment and to take a different and a better approach maybe to to markets and so i think there's a lot of interesting work here hopefully there's some ideas which others on this call can take away and take into your own work and we'll be sharing the recording um after this call um eli's already put his contact details into the the chat and if anyone wants to reach out to anyone from um any of the panel we can hopefully try to try to find a way to make that possible as well um, but I wanted to end by saying thank you. We have more events coming in this series over the next few months, and I hope that everyone has a good rest of your day. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye you, and bye to you all. Bye.